Well, hey everybody, welcome to this week's Approach in the Scene. Got some really fun stuff. I wanna take you on a little trip through Patagonia. I'm headed back to one of my absolute favorite places on earth to shoot. I've got eight amazing uh, friends and, and uh, workshop attendees that are gonna be coming with me. I'm down to one slot, the trip is a for sure go. And I've just been going through my old images and remembering how awesome this place is. So I thought I'd just go through a photo trip of what I love about Patagonia. I also wanted to address someone's question. If you wonder why this monster lens is sitting next to me, this is my old, uh, amazing 90s vintage 300 or 400 f 3.5 lens with a two times doubler. I've done a lot of work uh, on safari in Africa and doing bird photography with this lens. Despite it being manual focus, it's a beautiful old manual focus lens. The question I had was from Hyder, and he asked, you know, he got one of these 500 AH tripod heads on my recommendation. He was saying he was having just, just some difficulties figuring out how to lock down his camera with it. And he said, you know, show me that it locks down a big lens. Well, this is way more than this tripod is rated for. And, or this tripod head. It's my favorite head. The way that I handle putting big lenses on here is with a dedicated Manfrotto plate, a long version, attached right to the lens's foot. And then the key is to be able to shift forwards and backwards to where you get that balance point. Here's the, the, that plate, that long plate mounted on the foot. This is a heavy, big, old lens. This is not one of our new, late and great lenses. And what I do is I loosen the tilt on the tripod head and I just kind of rock this thing back and forth until I get it to a balance point and then lock it in at that balance point. And now anything you do, you can track birds in action. You can let go of the thing and it'll just sit there. That's the beauty of it, right? And you can do the same thing with your regular Arca Swiss mount. The way I mount this thing generally is with an Arca Swiss clamp on a shorter version of that same Manfrotto rail and you can slide it forwards and back and get your camera in perfect balance for, for photographing yourself level from below. So, but when you want to lock it off, you know, it's got this big knob, easy as pie to pull on and we're locked. This thing's going nowhere. I throw this on my shoulder and carry it around and I don't worry about it nearly as much as I did with ball heads that are not leveled. The other nice thing is, you know, and you've got the lock, that's the lock for the, for the tilt, then there's a lock for the pan right here. You shouldn't have to over torque either one and you are rigidly locked down. You know, I, I don't worry about this at all. The other nice thing is that if it does flop, with this big a lens, there's no way to get it balanced once it's tilted down, but watch, watch how slow it flops. You know, you're not gonna have a catastrophic failure where it goes bam and crashes your tripod over. I think fluid heads are just, they work for everything from the landscape to birds and wildlife to, to you name it. The ability to be level, stay level, do little adjustments, tilting and panning, and then do video movements too. It's just, I, I cannot ever in my wildest dreams imagine going back to a ball head. So there you go, Hyder. It definitely will lock down a big lens. No problemo. All right, so I'm gonna jump in. Let's go on a little trip through Patagonia. Oh, the one other update that I've got that's of interest is that the, the Mac Pro announced from, from Apple. I've thought about it from another week and I ordered a PC. 10 years ago, Microsoft Vista drove me to Mac and I've been happily in Mac land since, but the fact that there's nothing between the Mac Mini and the Mac Pro that's not an all-in-one built-in system, just they're not really designing a computer for me. Now granted, I could buy the Mac Pro and I could upgrade its video card and I could upgrade its RAM and I could upgrade its solid state drive to have the sizes that I need, but that would put it up in the eight or $9,000 realm. And I've bought a PC that's more powerful than the stock Mac Pro configuration by quite a long shot for under $3,000. You know, granted I could buy an iMac that would work great out of the box. The oddity to me is, you know, the iMac at $5,000 and it's straight out of the box configuration has four times the storage space on its SSD and a much nicer video card than the base configuration Mac Pro. The thing about the base configuration Mac Pro is you're just paying for that box, for that advanced architecture that could easily scale up to an NSA supercomputer or, you know, a JPL, you know, mathematical formula computer. Most of us don't need that. You know, maybe Pixar and the big animation studios need it. Maybe some of those three letter government agencies need it. And I'm sure they will sell to some of those big houses. It is, it can turn into a supercomputer. But for most of us, the upgradability is sort of a moot point. We're not gonna use a terabyte and a half of RAM. We're not gonna spend $25,000 on that. So, 
you know, for me, the fact that I, I have to choose between the Mac Mini or a $6,000 configuration on the next computer, I'm going to try out a PC. So it'll be a kind of a fun adventure. Um, we'll see how that goes. So let's go to Patagonia. Um, and, you know, God, Patagonia is just, this is basically the first day on the road with my wife on the last, the last time I went. And we're going to kind of retrace this trip on this workshop that I'm running this fall. Um, taken off at the end of October and through November, and I cannot wait to get back down here. We took off on this trip, and Stacy was actually uh, six months pregnant. We hadn't planned it that way. We booked the trip long in advance. We had a van rented. Uh, went with some some of my, my photography mentors, John Eastcott and Eva Momotuk, two of my favorite photographers. I'll put a link to their website uh, down below. They're just amazing photographers. They've been working for you know decades together, doing si assignments for Nat Geo and BBC and Smithsonian. Uh, but just driving along down there, you know, it's it's like the Wild West. You run into these rural scenes. You know, here's the shepherds with their their dogs herding the sheep on the side of the road. Constantly going by lakes with, you know, this is a Patagonian swan. Here's a caracara bird that was just flying off a fence post when we stopped at a, a place to get a little snack. The little towns that you go through, this is Puerto Natales in Chile on the edge of uh, Torres de Piney National Park. And it's just this kind of wonderful Wild West feeling, these really, really uh, self-sufficient people that have a cool frontier attitude and style, super friendly, great food. Uh, you know, here's a view out towards the mountains that lead into Taurus de Piney uh, from Porta Natalis there. And then the, the first night, this is the first sunset on the way in. It was a clear night, kind of waited and did, did a little sun star here and got a blue hour shot as we drove into where we were spending the night on, on Lago Pijo. Again, you know, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in a few months when this baby comes. Uh, a thing that we're going to repeat, we took the, the glacier trip out to Glacier Gray on this little boat and uh, went out on, on this beautiful Lago Gray and Torres de Piney National Park and photographed these, these just amazing ice formations and glaciers calving into the lake. Here's a shot of John and Eva right after that. They're just an amazing couple and I wish, wish they were coming with me on this trip, but uh, I can't wait to get back out with them. The view is just stupendous. We're actually on this trip going to be staying on a hotel on this island with this view for the Torres de Piney part of the trip. It's an 11 day adventure. Um, and these mountains in Torres de Piney, you got this beautiful granite that's sort of Yosemite style granite with this metamorphic capstone, a crazy ancient black rock and black rock, these layers and textures to it. They catch the light. The clouds in Patagonia are the thing that just blow my mind. They're ever changing. These mountains have moods that are shifting hour to hour, not day to day, hour to hour. Um, there's a burnt forest that makes wonderful foregrounds. You know, either, I, I could photograph these mountains for weeks and months on end and just continue making different images that have a different feel to them. The guanaco wandering all over are wonderful. It was, it was guanaco uh, breeding season, so, so there were baby guanacos being born. Every day we'd roll around and look at how the pregnant, the pregnant guanacos look. Growing up on a farm, I'm like, I think they're about to have babies. But just driving through there, this is dawn on the, on the towers from that spot in Lago Pijo. The weather is intense and then beautiful, and the clouds are constantly shifting. You know, I, I had uh, one, one of my frequent workshop co-conspirators who, who wanted to come on this workshop asked if his wife could come along, if we could figure out something for her to come along. And I said, you know, we're going to be stopping so often to photograph the intense cloud shapes that we see as a photographer. You just can't stop, wait to say, you know, you can't help yourself but say, stop, look at that cloud. We got to take photos of it. And, uh, you know, I know from, from my wife Stacy's experience, she's an extremely long suffering, amazing spouse, but she had it up to here with stopping every 10 minutes because the clouds had changed into some un, a new otherworldly form. Um, or there were a band of guanacos looking at me like that across the... <laughs> it was just constant stopping. This, this car, car landed on the hood of our car at Lago Pijo and a, little, and a little rainstorm in the sunshine popped up. You got Patagonian condors, Patagonian foxes, uh, baby guanacos arriving. We're going to be there in spring this year too. And, uh, you know, one of the things that blew my mind was the Patagonian flamingos. 
You know, you expect that in Africa, or but South America has its flamingos too, and they tr cruise all the way down there. So we'll travel from Chile into Argentina, and we'll go, this is the road into El Chaltan. This is Mount Fitzroy. Uh, Cerro Torre is back here, two famed peaks in, in climbing lore. And this, these roads, this, is, this gives you a feel for the roads that we travel there. I mean, it's just, it's like the West before it was settled. And it, the, this part of the mountains, when you get into this Argentinian part around El Chaltan and Fitzroy, it feels like the Tetons kind of on steroids. You got wild horses there, uh, you know, cloudscapes. Again, they just never stop. You know, this, I remember this sunset went on for hours. I could show you a hundred different photos of this night's sunset, and they're all different. You know, the next morning was incredible. Uh, this is all from just around El Shaltan. Uh, I mean, I, I love the sign, you know. It, it's like they knew I was coming. I'm the panoramic aficionado. This is my good friend John. <laughs> he kind of posed for me there. I have no idea what that symbol is. What is that? But I, I know what panoramico means. And it's filled with panoramic vistas and just ridiculous clouds. You start getting the idea of what happens in the skies here. This is a big panorama. I might take it a second to load in. Um, yeah, big panorama. I think I shot this with my Nikon D810 with uh, several rows of images, so it's probably 20,000 pixels wide. Yeah, but my, there you go. Every day, just something different. Um, and one of the great things about this, you know, I went with John and Eva, who uh, Eva had had a, a spiral fracture of her uh, tibia amphibia that she was recovering from, and there's just the lion's share of this is all photographed within just a few feet of the car. I mean, it's the, the roads get you just where you need to be around there. Uh, and some are gravel, but they're good gravel. We're gonna have two vans. Uh, my good friend David Archer is coming along with me from South Carolina, amazing wildlife photographer, great landscape photographer, and a fun guy to be with. And it's nice because we're, we're only taking eight people. So it's gonna be four to one. Again, we only have one spot left for this, but uh, 11 days on this trip through uh, starting in Chile and ending in Argentina. There's Cerro Torre, which is just a fabled peak. It was, you know, controversial whether someone, an Italian, actually summited it in the 1970s. Of course, now people go up it in a, in a day with the lightweight gear and skills and tools that we have now. But back then, it, it was often called unclimbable in the climbing lore. So one thing that we did on this trip, we left Eva behind in El Shaltan, which is an amazing place to spend time and photograph. And John and Stacy and I, even though Stacy was six and a half months pregnant, maybe even seven months pregnant at that point, uh, we hiked up, it's a, not a very long hike, up into Lago Torre, which is right below Cerro Torre. You go through this really beautiful forest. There's tons of wildlife and birds. That's a Patagonian woodpecker. Kind of reminds me of a pileated woodpecker, about the same size too, but just all redhead. Totally, totally cool. Um, and we got up to Lago Torre right at the base of Cerro Torre. It's not a huge elevation gain. I think it's maybe 1,200 feet of elevation gain over like 10 kilometers. But we went up and spent the night, and a group of us that are capable are going to do that at the very end of the workshop, so day 10, day 11. Uh, and anybody that wants to is welcome to join. Uh, and we had an amazing, clear, reflecting night. We got up there, it was kind of windy, and then the wind died as we set up camp. Uh, and then we had stars that night. It was just magnificent. The next morning was, again, still clear, a little bit of ice on the water. Just an incredible spot to be. Um, I cannot wait to get back. I'm, I'm already getting excited. One of the reasons I'm doing this video is I was going over images and planning and get, talking to some of the, the guides and people there in hotels and getting excited. And I just thought, oh, i got to share how excited I am to get back here. You know, I could, I could photograph up here for days on end, too. I was only there for maybe 12 hours and most of that asleep. But just look at what was possible. Um, there's Cerro Torre. And here's, here's a good reason why they... Uh, they say it was unclimbable, this ice mushroom growing on the top of it. Clearly, I had a little sensor dust I got to take out on this image. Another place I want to get to during that two days, if the weather's good uh, with a group that's capable, is this just amazing waterfall. It's kind of a hidden gem off the beaten path. Not many people know where it is. Uh, anybody I take has got to be a little bit sworn to secrecy on that so it doesn't get swarmed with people. But I actually had people claiming that this wasn't real when I posted it because they'd never seen photos of it. 
Um, but it's, it's quite spectacular. There's a lower fall that's also really, really beautiful uh, down near El Shatam where you get Fitzroy in the background that's popularly photographed. And the whole group will photograph that, but I'd love to take a group up to this. It takes, it takes a bit of a hike, and to get done late, it's an early morning hike. So with that, uh, you can see why I'm so stoked to be going. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a while since I've had uh, a mountain adventure quite on the scale of Patagonia, and I can't wait to get back. So, all right, that's this week's episode. I had a great question from Gary, uh, and I hear your question, and I will address it, asking about, you know, I talk about the Nikon Z camera is not doing depth of field preview at apertures smaller than 5.6 at 100% zoom and I talk about how I use my older DSLRs to check focus in the landscape and get perfectly accurate focus by zooming in on the live view and Gary asked could you demonstrate that so you know what I'll do either next week or the week after depending on how much time I got a I'm heading off for a workshop in Bandon this weekend um, but at, in the southern Oregon coast that I'm excited about too but um, uh, I'll do a video where I showcase how I do that on say my D850 or my D500 and then I'll show how I can't do it on the Z camera. I'll try to make a real quick one that just showcases that where I film the live view at the same time. All right, so thanks everyone. Again, you know, a lot of this stuff comes from the conversation, the questions I get in the YouTube comments, the emailed questions that I get. Hit me up anytime. Uh, I, I love the conversation and I really want this video to be driven by the people who are consuming it. I wanna talk about what you wanna hear. So hit me up reach out. I'm easy to get. We'll see you next week.